All right. So let me do a quick introduction. This is Joni. She is our perennial retail tail manager over in Aurora. Um, and she is our herb whisperer. I'll call her that. She's a she's an herb expert. She knows everything about herbs. Um, she is starting her 30th year here this year. And take it away, Joni. Uh, thank you, Becca. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to another presentation of Herbs at the Growing Place. Uh, we're so proud of our herbs uh, here at the Growing Place in their own frame. We grow 120 varieties of herbs for you. Uh, we sell them out on our edible section of the retail yard. Uh, they're coming out soon, very soon, some sooner than others. Uh, but this is a great time to think about herbs because it's March and March 20th means the first day of spring. It means the sun is out brighter than ever and it just gets better. And so we're so glad you've come. Uh, we're gonna do our little container first. I think that you all have this. And I guess, I guess. Uh, any, the, oh, actually I forgot. There was a little snafu. So if you have not picked up your herb kit yet, they are still here and we will be here Monday through Friday this upcoming week, 10 to 4, if you want to come in and pick it up at um, whichever location you suggest you selected. Um, I'm thinking, Becca, that we need to tilt the computer down so they can see this better. Okay. I want them to see the whole thing. Perfect. Not quite. Yeah. Per perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So there we are. I'll just stoop down a little bit so you can see me, but it's more important for you to see the plants. So you've got your container. It's important that it has drainage. Whatever container you decide to use for your herb plants, uh, they have to have sun, they have to have good soil, and they have to have drainage. Drainage is really, really important. And the first thing we're going to do for those of you that have already picked up your two herbs, whatever they are, and your little violas. I'm going to fill this container halfway filled with potting soil. This is our growing place mixture. Uh, we're so proud of it. It's our own recipe, and I use it for everything in containers. So I have filled this halfway filled with the potting soil. I might put just a little bit more in. The thing is, the herbs that you have and the herbs that we sell are always in this little three inch pot. And so I wanna be able to put these in and then add more soil on top of it. So when I remove this beautiful basil, this is what you're gonna see. These incredible roots where the life comes to the leaves. But you see, they've been in the container long enough that they have formed the shape of the pot. So I want to break this up just a little bit, just a little bit, so that these roots will grow into the soil. The better uh, they can reach out, uh, the more food they can receive, and the faster they'll grow for you. So I'm just going to pop this one right into one edge over here. I'm allowing room for one of the violas here. There will be a viola in the middle and one at the end, but there's room for both the herbs. So by filling the soil only halfway full, now I have room for this wonderful basil, which we're gonna talk about exactly which one that is as it happens. Okay, so the other herb that we're gonna put in this morning, I have the Italian parsley. The Italian parsley is the flat leaf one that is the very best for cooking with. And because the leaves are so big, uh, they have more essential oils in them for cooking. Oh, look, it's so happy the roots are coming out from the bottom. If I rip those off, it doesn't matter. They don't need those right now. So we're gonna pull this out. And that's what you're doing too. So again, we have the roots forming the shape of the container. You can see that. So if I don't tease these roots, they're gonna to continue to grow in the shape of the pot. I want them to grow into this container or whatever container you have. So very carefully, if I break some, it's okay. Uh, I'm gonna put this right into our soil that we already have here. Now, because the little violas that you have are so tiny, I'm gonna add a little bit more soil yet. So we never use garden soil for these containers because it's got too much clay in it and they'll have too much of a hard time uh, growing. So we use our potting soil 
and I'm just scooping it in with my hands. It's wonderful to get our hands dirty. I love this. Smells just like summer. Okay, so now I've got those in. And I pat it down, but not too tight because um, I want the water to be able to flow into it. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So this one has the Greek columnar basil. So this fits perfectly. It's a perfect basil for container because it grows like a column. And as much as we all love our sweet basil, and I know you do, that would fill up the whole pot too quick. And this one grows straight up just like a Greek column. All right, so now I'm just gonna take my little finger, which is the best dibbler there is, and I'm sticking a hole in the middle and on both ends. I have already taken one of the violas and you see they have these tight little plugs, okay? So I'd like to open those up just a little bit too so those roots will grow out. All right, so I've pulled it apart just at the base, just at the base like that. And I think I'll put the middle one in first. So this is a bright little yellow one. By the way, the petals of the violas and the pansies are edible. Not the first flush of flower, but the second flush. We don't eat the petals, but we eat the flowers. So that's gonna go in there just as cute as can be. And the second one will be over here on the left. I'll pull apart the plug. We call this a plug. And we just plug it right into that little hole. Close the soil around it. And I've got a third one. And hopefully you do too. So I pull the roots apart. I'm taking off any yellow leaves. And I'm going to stick this right in too. And it is just that simple. It's just that simple, except for one step. We have to water this. So this is something that will need water soon. We're not flooding it. We're not drenching it. We're just going to gently add good drinking water. Uh, water that is not from the softener, but rather it can be your tap water, but we do want to water it. I water each plant separately. Uh, I would like to have it fully watered, but not mud. We're not looking for mud. You're going to have to keep an eye on this watering probably twice, maybe three times a week. Just keep an eye on it. This little container is going to go in your sunniest window. It wants as much sun as it can get. The more sun it gets, the more you have to keep an eye on that water because it's critical. But these are all edible today. Okay, they've not been sprayed. These are grown in their own greenhouse. And so if they ever have issues, uh, we have wonderful beneficials uh, such as ladybugs that will take care of them. So these are in our edible area, which will be over with the other things like fruits and berries and fruit trees. Uh, we have a full, full selection, but this is what you have. And so I suggest to you that you can have this, <clears throat> pardon me, producing flowers probably at least through uh, the 4th of July. So you've got at least four months of wonderfulness and longer because some of these can be replaced as they get too big. Parsley is a biennial, and that means you get two years out of it. So that you may want to put in the ground later. Basil is really a one-year plant. That's what annual is, one year. And this will grow wonderful. So I'm going to show you how they really can grow. All right, so this is our pot. I'm just going to put that right here so you can see it. Okay. And does anybody have any questions about these? I have a couple questions. Uh, one. If they want to bring this pot outside once it gets warmer, where should they put it? It's going to be a while before this basil can take. The, I mean, when we say warm, this does not like to go under 40 degrees. That's the lowest it can go outside. So you've got to be careful right now. It's still in the 20s at night, so not so much. So put it somewhere you'll see it. Uh, when you do put it outside, because you can have this outside all summer and you can exchange plants and use them all up, eat them, whatever. But I do keep them nearby so I can keep an eye on the water. The containers always need a little bit more water than those in the garden. But for now, it's got to be inside in a sunny window as you can provide, or maybe you have grow lights, uh, but keep it warm and as much sun as possible. Okay.
And then if anybody had, uh, Arlene has overwintered a basil plant from last summer. It's starting wow. to flower. Is there anything she should do to keep it healthy? Or should sure. it be cut down? Sure, so uh, no matter what kind of basil it is, we have here at the growing place 21 varieties of basil. How cool is that? And they all, to me, they're all annuals and they produce like crazy. The more you use them, the more they branch out. They, some of them, this one does not produce flowers, but some of them do produce flowers. Uh, consistently, I cut off. Oh, thank you. Good. Yeah. Consistently, I remove the flowers, but by the way, you can put those in your stir fry. They're perfectly edible. But I do cut them off because sometimes when you let the herbs, any of the herbs start to flower, they become a little bitter. So uh, cut the herbs, uh, flowers off and use them or throw them out. It doesn't matter. Uh, but the basils are wonderful and they do smell like summer and there's nothing better in a container. But this one, this is the Greek columnar. Let me just show you how wonderful they are. Okay. This is what I'm talking about. There are three of these Greek columnarts in here, three of them. And this is our mother plant. This is what we take the cuttings from to get these beautiful plants that you have, if you have this one. And they do not flower, uh, but they're as edible as any of the basils. They're all edible. Consistently, they are an annual here. And for me, I just let them do their whole life cycle, and then I'm ready for another one. But uh, these are incredible. Uh, they're incredible, even if you just do one. The Greek columnar allows you to have room for other herbs in a container. For example, by your back door, you have a container, or by your grill. You can have a basil, a thyme, a chive, a parsley, but it allows you to have room for the sweet basil, which we adore and we all buy, we all have to have it, but it fills up the whole pot. It's so full and fat and wonderful that it fills the whole pot. So I love the Greek columnar. That's one of my favorites of so many. Okay, so I'm gonna put that over here. Anyway, that makes a pretty pot. And these are adorable. This is something that could go on your picnic table. Uh, or just somewhere you'll see it and enjoy it. So I'm so glad we've done that. Uh, it's just nice to get our hands dirty. So unless you have other questions so I about- a, I, had a, I have one question um, about our potting soil and how it differs from like something you would get commercially. Um, it's, a, it's our custom blend that we have created. It's just a lightweight mix, it's soilless um, and it's what we grow all of our plants in. Uh, so it's just, we like to grow in it, so we thought you might like to grow in it too. Um, there is a minimal starter charge fertilizer in there, but there is no like if you if you were to say go get a Miracle Grow, it would have more. Uh, um, it would have the Miracle Grow fertilizer in it. Uh, ours is not. It just has a starter charge, a, a beginning starter charge, and then you would have to fertilize throughout the season for the health of your plants. Um, and then I had another question about harvesting basil. How often do you do it? Uh, the more often you do it, the more branching it will get, the more leaves you will have. So uh, with this, uh, I'd probably, I usually start at the top because that's what encourages more branching, but any of them are perfectly fine. And I use these directly into a salad. Uh, or in herbal butters, uh, but yes, the more you harvest them, don't wait until some warm day in August or September to harvest because they'll be overgrown and the older leaves will be bitter. So start using them as soon as you want. I mean, even tonight, you can pull some of these off and use them for sure, any of the herbs. Um, this Italian parsley is wonderful, but I'm gonna show you. So this is, this is, how it grows up to be, but they have the very large leaves. And I, I already said, uh, they have the essential oils that really are delicious. I just made some Asian soup a couple of days ago and I add the leaves in cooking with 
any fresh herbs, I consistently use two tablespoons and I add them at the very last couple of minutes of cooking so that I get the real flavor. If you put them in too soon, the flavor dissipates. But Italian parsley is the one with all the flavor. The, um, the curly parsley, which we all know and love, uh, this is something that is a breath freshener, but it's also uh, just a magical plant for attracting the swallowtail butterflies. If you're interested in butterflies, you need to have these, and I, you could have like three of them in your garden and right on the edge, and the swallowtail, you know, the ones that are black with a pretty blue on them, they will love this. They will lay their eggs on it, so it's okay if you see the black and yellow and white um, caterpillars on it. They're working. They're doing their job. Uh, other herbs that the black swallowtail or the eastern black swallowtail, they call it, are fennel and dill. Okay, uh, we all know dill. This, these are annuals. However, uh, the flowers and the seeds are edible, but these grow into two feet tall plants and the swallowtail will lay her eggs that are like tiny little pearls on them. So again, if you see all this going on, this is a blessing. I mean, these are little um, wonderful critters that just come and, and uh, make our gardens beautiful. Uh, we carry this deal. Now this is the shorter one. So this is the little fern leaf one. And uh, they're beautiful. Tony, what, was it? what was the name of the um, plant you're holding right now again? This is our dill. This is called fern leaf dill. So this is the shorter. There are other dill varieties that are very tall and we don't think they're as pretty. So this is the one that we carry here. Uh, and we also carry, uh, this is Florence fennel. So Florence fennel, not either of these, either the dill or the fennel are going to drop seed. And if you let them do that, they'll be coming back. Although to be considered a perennial, it has to come back by the root, but these will come back by seed. So Florence fennel is the one that maybe you've seen it in an antipasto uh, with the bulb. So these grow the bulb that you can uh, eat raw like celery or uh, saute, but these are also, you know, your butterfly plants for sure. Okay, so uh, that's the parsley. But I want to talk about sage. We're kind of going to do the Simon Garfunkel thing, you know, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. So we're on to sage. And if you have sage officinalis in your McCormick can in your pantry, this is what you've got. And sometimes it's all powdery and sometimes they've got whole leaves in there. Uh, but this is what it is. This is a perennial, which means it can survive our winter. And the second year, it will have flowers. They'll be either purple or pink or white, you never know. But the branching is there through the winter. Uh, mine already has uh, green leaves on it. They're very, very tough. And I use this in cooking all the time. I don't think I'll go into too many specifics about cooking, although I can, but uh, sage to me is critical. You know, anything with poultry or my cornbread. So that this is the regular sage that you all have. We have another one called sage berm garden and I don't have the leaves with me today, but they're larger leaves. And it's a beautiful plant. I have that in my very, very front garden and people know where I live, so they're looking. Okay, so then we've got, uh, this is a purple one. This is the purple sage. You can see the color on it. Uh, these are consistently hardy, but not always. And you just never know, they can come back. Uh, the officinalis is the one that always comes back, assuming you have good drainage and assuming you have full sun, which is six hours. Full sun does not mean all day. It means it would like six hours if possible. So, but these are also beautiful in containers and in window boxes. So I love them and they're all edible. And then we have, the golden sage, which has these beautiful leaves. Can you see that on there? And the, these are just babies. They're just kids like what you just have at home. Just, uh, just young plants. And they grow into, one. It, this one year, they will grow into beautiful plants like a volleyball. That's how big they'll be. They'll be incredible. And the color that this foliage offers. Uh, but it is also edible. Then we have... 
Where's Mary? So I'm going to try to show you this one. Oh my goodness. So this, this is our mother plant of the creeping rosemary. You know this plant, it's the herb of remembrance. Um, it is incredible. People use it for so many things. Um, rosemary, I found it over here too. So rosemary has these like needle-like leaves, okay, which are full of essential oils. And I do lots of things with them. We have several varieties of rosemary. Some of them I brought back from California and we grow our own. Um, thing about rosemary is it wants the sun, but keep an eye on the water. It's not a water loving plant, but don't let it dry out because it is not forgiving if perhaps it collapses. You know, other plants say, oh, that's fine. Give it water and it perks right up. Rosemary says, no, 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 I, I don't do that. So I sometimes keep a saucer with pebbles on it uh, to keep the humidity going for it. But uh, of course, uh, the flowers are edible. This one has little flowers on it right now. If you can eat the herb, you can eat the flowers of it, as long as they've not been sprayed. Um, anyway, I do love this. I love to chop up the foliage and I put, again, two tablespoons into my favorite shortbread or sugar cookies. Uh, I, just, I just love it. Now, we've got one of the rosemaries called barbecue rosemary and it's very vertical and it's got long woody stems. They all have woody stems, but I suggest to you the one we call barbecue has the straighter woody stem and I'll soak uh, four or five of them in water and then I use them as skewers on my grill and I'll put the meat and the vegetables on there. By having soaked it in water it won't burn up but uh, it really gives it that wonderful rosemary flavor. Just love it. Okay so then we have thyme. Now I don't know how many times we have here. We have more than I can remember. They're all wonderful. We keep the thymes that are culinary with the edible herbs. We keep the times that are low growing and flat with our ground covers. And yes, they're edible too, but their leaves are real tidy and they're meant to be used in pathway plants between your flagstone. But these other ones are incredible. This happens to be lime thyme. And I assure you, it has that wonderful citrusy smell when you rub it and the essential oils are released. Uh, we have lemon thyme, we have oregano thyme. Now don't be confused because uh, it's not oregano. This is thyme that has a scent like oregano. It's the coolest thing. And I love to put that in containers. But what I'm trying to say is this plant this little bitty oregano thyme or lemon thyme or lime thyme or whichever one, they, they will do this in one season, okay? It is considered a ground cover, but I do not consider it aggressive. I have them growing all along my 40-foot path from the driveway to my front door, and they are evergreen. I mean, the snow melted magically, thank goodness, and there's all my thyme, although I've been using them all winter. Uh, and they're wonderful. And I love to make our butters that I put on meat. Uh, the lemon thyme or the lime thyme I like on seafood. But anyway, uh, they will do this this year, assuming they have sun and they only need average soil, but it needs to be well drained. And then a new plant, of course, you need to keep an eye on the water. So anyway, these are the times. So we've got parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. So there you have that. Okay. I'll move this over here. Um, speak, oh, here's another one. This is called golden lemon thyme. So take a look at the foliage on this. Do you see how it's golden with green? So this is gonna go into one of my containers, lemon. Remember, it's golden lemon thyme. So I'm gonna put with this lemon verbena. So this is something we also sell. That's lovely for teas, it's lovely uh, in scones um, and fruit salad, but it's lemon. So now we've got golden lemon thyme. We've got a lemon verbena. I might put a lemon basil in with it and uh, maybe some uh, yellow marigolds just to give it even more color. So I like to do the theme containers, but 
we can just break out of the traditional. We can have just a little bit of fun with these. And I love to have an herb pot and always at least 14 inches. Uh, 16 inches is better uh, because then you don't have to water them quite so much. And I put these by uh, the grill or by the back door, or by the front door, and everybody who walks by them brushes against them and they smell incredible. So that makes me think of scented geraniums. Now this is a geranium, like you may know, but we sell these in the herb department. And they have flowers, but they're not known for the flowers. They're known for their foliage. And these are gonna root out real quick. I just snipped these this morning and they will root out and be wonderful. But I bake with these and uh, I put them in the bottom of a baking sheet and with the uh, flour and oil. And then the batter of the cake um, is on top and the uh, essential oils permeate the baking cake. And then you just peel those off. You can eat them but um, I don't necessarily, I, I really love the Atara of Rose. That's my favorite one. We have many flavors. We have nutmeg and lemon, all kinds of scented germs, and they're beautiful in containers. And I like them in a container, although they can get pretty sizable, but I like them in the house because when I'm vacuuming or brushing by, again, these leaves release this incredible fragrance. And it's just like being in your garden if you close your eyes. So anyway, then I sometimes would save some leaves. Um, then I love the dry ones because I use those for potpourri and save the flowers uh, for garnish on the cake. So anyway, scented geraniums are awesome. Again, they're over in our edible department and never sprayed. Okay, um, I should talk about, uh, we were talking about pathway plants. And if you're putting in a new patio with bricks or pavers or flagstone, you know, make sure you allow enough room so that a three inch pot of something wonderful, whether it's a juga or this is um, Roman chamomile. You know this for the flowers that make the tea. But this is a wonderful perennial ground cover herb that will fill in those cracks. And it has tiny little daisy-like flowers that are so pretty. But this is a chamomile, and I know you're familiar with this. So anyway, that's something to think about. But just you have to allow enough space. Or sometimes if you already have an existing pathway and you don't have room, uh, I have sometimes removed a brick or a paver to plant in there or planted the herbs alongside the pathway so that uh, as people walk up to wherever they're going at your home, uh, they can smell it. And if they walk on them, it smells incredible. All right, so that is that. <clears throat> uh, we didn't, <clears throat> pardon me, we didn't talk about oregano. And of course, we have several varieties of oregano, the traditional uh, Greek oregano, which is the one consistently we use most in cooking. I'm going to say again that the fresh herbs should be added in your cooking in the last very few minutes. Uh, they are more potent in flavor than the dried herbs. So we have, to, or not really, I think the dry is more, point. anyway, the point is you have to use twice as much fresh foliage in your cooking as the dry. The dry has, I don't know, but when it rehydrates, it just explodes with flavor. But when I use all these fresh herbs, I use twice as much as the dry. So anyway, this is golden oregano, which I love in containers. I mean, think how pretty that would be either with the golden oregano or with the purple sage or with the purple sage. Uh, we have a tri-colored sage. And I just think for window boxes, it's really, really pretty. But this is almost evergreen. It's already green in our gardens here in Aurora. And it's a wonderful ground cover. And so, but it'll spill out. And we always like that when it's doing that, like the time will spill out. So this is golden oregano. And then we have um, one of my favorites. Oh, they're all my favorites. So this is chives. Now my chives, even in my containers, they overwinter and they're not flowering yet, but they're already showing about two inches of their foliage regular chives, and of course we have several varieties of chives, they have a tubular stem like spaghetti, okay? And they're, they're just wonderful on your potato and your egg salad. 
on your soup. Uh, my goodness, in everything, I mix it with cream cheese to put on my bagel in the morning. Uh, very perennial, very hearty, and they produce a wonderful purple flower. And I don't have any right now because they're so little, but they these even will flower. And they have a lavender colored flower that is just a little bit smaller than a ping pong ball, which is absolutely edible. Again, if you can eat the leaves, you can eat the flower. And so the chai flower, I'm just saying if you put it on, say, a baby spinach salad, the little purple balls would look cute, but your family might not go for that. So I prefer to break apart the flower uh, into little flowerettes. And it's, it's subtle. It's got that lavender color and the dark green spinach, but it adds that subtle onion flavor. So anyway, to me, chives are essential. And they do winter over beautifully in containers. Okay. Hey, Joni. Joni. Can you talk about uh, why um, rabbits don't really like the herbs? Yes, yes. Uh, consistently, but not always, but consistently, because the herbs have uh, these incredible leaves that when you rub against them, they release their essential oils and the rabbits do not like to rub their fur against, for example, lavender, or sage, or rosemary, or many of the herbs, because then that essential oil is on their fur, and they become a target for Mrs. Fox or whoever. So it actually works uh, beautifully as a repellent, uh, but they're not sprayed. Uh, but yes, uh, consistently, the rabbits will leave them alone, for sure. Okay. Uh, and don't forget, I mean, these herbs don't have to be in a pot. They can be uh, just threaded through your regular garden, through your ornamental garden. Uh, they are considered, you know, landscape plants. And I love to put uh, any of the sages because they grow into these beautiful clumps. They're incredible. And they have flowers. They all have flowers. And But the rabbits leave them alone. So if you're putting these next to other uh, delicious plants that rabbits love. For example, I might put uh, the thyme plant under my lilium or uh, some other plant that the, the rabbits particularly like, of which there are many. But this is a deterrent because the rabbits might walk on this and say, oh, no, they don't want it. So it's a good thing. Okay, so we have some other interesting herbs that you may not know. Uh, because as I said, we have over 120 herbs here. This one, and it's the baby. Okay, this is called Lovage, which is going to grow at least three feet tall and can be perennial in Chicago. And it has a celery-like flavor and look. And so all parts are edible, be it the stems or the leaves. Uh, Lovage is incredible, whether it's in your vegetable garden or in your... Uh, ornamental garden, but this is lovage. So with a celery, like I like this, like a chicken salad. Okay, got those. Um, you know, we talked about maybe a lemon pot with uh, the lemon thyme and maybe the lemon verbena and the lemon basil, but another plant that could go in that would be lemongrass. So we grow this here and they're just, they're just kids right now, but they will grow into a beautiful plant it is not consistently hardy here in Chicago. So that is why some of these I like to keep in a pot like the rosemary or the scented geraniums or even the lemongrass so that I can easily bring them in uh, next September. Uh, and of course, it is the base of the lemongrass that is used uh, mostly in Asian cooking. So, but they're very, very pretty plants. You have to just have faith that they're gonna grow into this incredible plant. All these things will. Um, these stock plants, they're only one year old. And so when you have a perennial, uh, the second year, or in some cases, the first year, they're gonna grow into this incredible plant. So, okay. Um, this is lavender. I think we better talk about that. This is one of everybody's favorite. This one is happens to be flowering. And this is, uh, I believe, this is French lavender, which is an annual, but that's okay. It can do this in one season if you keep uh, trimming it up and they have very edible flowers. 
we have varieties of lavender that are perennial, that are very hardy. They have to have good drainage. They must have good drainage. And I usually like them in a slightly raised bed, uh, maybe a little pea gravel in there, a uh, little sand maybe, but they have to be a little higher than everything. So when we get our heavy rains, they're not sitting in wet. It's a gray foliage plant and any gray foliage plant, whether it is lavender or dusty miller or Russian sage, any of the gray plants have to have good drainage and full sun. But this is lavender and I think these are incredible and you know what to do with these. I do like to dry the flowers and I will put those in my shortbread or cookies. And I dry the foliage, which is extremely fragrant. And I will put that in cheesecloth in my linen drawer. But is this not a beautiful container plant? Sometimes we will sell these stock plants as well, so you can immediately have this wonderfulness. But um, these are all just incredible creations that are grown here by our propagator and growers. So that's lavender, but Munstead and Hid coat are consistently the varieties that do the best. We have phenomenal and a couple of others that can do very, very well. But again, we're talking about good sun and good drainage and somewhere you can see them so you'll enjoy them. All right, so then I've got uh, Angelica. Uh, this is a really old herb and this is going to be three to four feet tall when it grows up. This is a biennial, first year leaves, second year flowers. The flowers on this are incredible. They are kind of the size of a garlic bulb and they are burgundy and shiny and works of art. And when you have a couple of these planted together, whether they're in an herb garden or just in your landscape, they are absolutely stunning. Uh, I've seen these in some of the nicest estates out there because, and I saw one, a garden that had three of them in different groups in their parkway and it was absolutely gorgeous but it's a plant the pioneers brought and the parts that they used to eat would be the stem which they cook like asparagus or they candy it like for in fruitcake like a citron so perfectly edible uh, this is called um, angelica gingus so okay now here's another interesting one and again, I'm showing you mostly the kids. You know, these are just the babies, which will be beautiful. And you will see in the perennial department and around our stores that we use some of these plants in containers to show them off or in our beautiful gardens. We have incredible learning gardens. We have over 20 gardens at both the Aurora and the Neighborville store. And they are a way for you to see what a lot of these plants grow up to be, whether they're annuals or perennials or roses. Uh, we love to show off our plants. This one is from the medieval times, and this is called silver sage. And you can see it is silver and it's got a very furry foliage on it. And they get to be pretty sizable, not giant, but sizable, and they're beautiful in a container. Another gray foliage, so lots of sun, good drainage, has a yellow flower. And I, I'd love to see this paired with other purple foliage plants. Uh, so this doesn't always come back, it can come back, but I'd love to put this, for example, with some of the annual purple leafed plants. But it is from you know hundreds of years ago, uh, in medieval gardens. So it's called silver sage. So do love that. Okay. Jokey, could you talk a little bit about cilantro and how to have success so it doesn't bolt or if uh, there's a different way to grow cilantro? Of course. I'm glad you asked. So um, we all know what to do with cilantro. We all love it and it's incredible. And uh, yes, uh, for sure. But if you're buying cilantro to eat, I suggest you get a couple of plants because it is not as, um, you know, some of these are really strong, tough plants. And cilantro, you know, sometimes you'll use a whole plant for a recipe. So I like to get a couple of recipe, a couple of plants. And at the same time, I may buy a packet of cilantro seeds so that they can be coming up and coming up because this is, it is an annual. And of course it's too soon to plant the seeds, but nevertheless, uh, cilantro is very popular. If you just use some of each plant with each recipe, you know, that will stimulate more growth. 
uh, but they're incredible. I mean, what is better? You know, we've got cilantro and parsley with our wonderful tomatoes, which we're growing. Um, but yeah, you need to you need to have a cilantro, of course. There's so many herbs to choose from that it's difficult to say, okay, which ones do I want to grow in a pot or uh, alongside my patio? So it, it's really hard. So you want to think about the five that you'd most use or the most you'd like to try. And so, you know, I always go with um, thyme and parsley and chives and basil. I mean, I just, that's what I would do, but, but uh, we can help you with that. Um, again, the bigger the pot, the more you can fit in and the less you have to water. Joni, so. is there a, a uh, there, there's no like depth requirement for the pot, right? Or not okay. too shallow? Yeah. No, no, yeah. they're very short rooted. You don't need to worry about it. No, if you have um, a foot, it's nice. 10 inches or a foot is fine. Oh, 10 inches to a foot, okay, thank you. Yeah, that, that works for depth, for sure. Uh, can you tell if you had rosemary in the ground over the growing season is there any tips you have for bringing it inside for the winter well as i said mine's always in a pot so that i don't have to worry about it but um the more uprights would be easier to transplant because the this is a creeping rosemary and those leaves will have spread out on your soil, so we might have less of a challenge if you had more one of the upright ones. And they're not uh, heavy rooters, okay? So you should be able to dig those up very easily and put them in, you know, at least a 10 inch pot. I, I really like the bigger pots, but at least a 10 inch pot. They can take quite a bit of cold, they really can. And if you don't bring it in till Halloween, that's probably fine. Um, <clears throat> but I could see why you'd want it in the ground. I mean, it's a beautiful plant for sure. But it's got to come in because it cannot. So, you know, if we were in Arizona or Southern California, you'd have bushes of rosemary. But where we live, they love it outside. They love to be used. But um, it needs to come in. Okay. Okay. Um, do you, are there any risks of cross-pollinating uh, herbs such as like cilantro and another herb or like no. dill and fennel? No, you don't need to worry about that. No. And then do you think uh, six inches would be too shallow for a pot? How much? Or six inches. Well, you know, it's, it's fine for short-term success, but uh, the smaller the pot, the more water you're going to have to attend to. Uh, it's going to need a little more attention. Um, right now in our houses, in our windowsill, I mean, it's absolutely perfect because we still don't have the amount of sun we're going to have coming up very, very soon. So uh, they'll be fine. They really just sort of exist and grow slightly. But once we get into our real growing season, they're going to grow fast and they're going to need to be repotted for sure. So all, always a larger pot is better. Okay, and then um, there's a question about how, if herbs would help keep rabbits away from your hostas. And I would just say rabbits will try anything once. So maybe. <laughs> I do love hosta. Uh, and I have a lot of success with them in containers over winter because I use big containers. Um, so yeah, it's rabbit food for sure. So uh, there's a couple ways to go about it. Uh, I do say consistently that having uh, herbs such as sage or lavender around them, the problem is that those herbs like a lot of sun and the hosta not so much. So the only other herb, there's two herbs that could work as preventatives for the hosta in a shady situation. And one is sweet woodruff, which is a galium. It is a star-shaped leaf with white flowers in May. Uh, it's again, one of those very, very old herbs and the rabbits don't eat that. Uh, they also might not eat mint. Now, don't run away when I say mint because it's wonderful and it's delicious. And I use this as a ground cover. And around my trees where my grass doesn't grow, the mint will grow and it can be mowed. 
but it is keeping the soil away from eroding. But again, the leaves have so much, so many essential oils that the rabbits don't like it. So you could try planting mint around your hosta. I will tell you another so, trick I do with my hosta because- Tony, I would say you will have to be a diligent gardener if you plant mint because it, I mean, we have to be careful with planting that. and it, it, Yes, if you do plant mint, uh, I keep mine in a container and I cut off the bottom and I cut off the flowers and that will control it, but it would stop the rabbits. So sometimes we have to choose, but I have this growing under a tree so that my soil won't erode and it, as a ground cover, it works perfectly. Um, the other thing I'm going to suggest to you about the hosta, because the hosta are one of the first perennials that will appear and <laughs> I, I want my hosta, I need, I need my hosta. So I save the little mesh that comes with my fruit, you know, your clementines or whatever you're eating. And I put uh, that mesh around the plant and even sometimes over it because until the grass comes up, the rabbit's favorite food is gonna be the clover of your grass or the grass. But one, if you're spraying the grass, that's a problem. But two, the clover flowers don't come. So I suggest to you uh, for a temporary but immediate protection of the hosta that you use the mesh of the fruit or potatoes or onions and I, I pin it down with uh, silverware and I get you know silverware over at Goodwill or plastic silverware to pin this mesh down. And I guarantee that the rabbits are, they won't touch it. Now, once the hosta really fills out, then usually by then the lawn is green and they will eat that. Uh, and sometimes in that case, I will leave the mesh, but just in a circle like a donut around the hosta, but it works every time it truly does. Okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about when you should put herbs outside um, or when you should move the herbs outside? Well, our frost date here is consistently, they say the end of May, but I can't ever wait. So uh, I would say by uh, mid-May, you can put them out, but watch your temperature. If it's below 32 degrees at night, you may have to cover them with uh, a bin or a sheet or uh, some sort of protection, but uh, I probably wouldn't put them out until after uh, right around mid-May. So that would be my suggestion for success there. Um, any other questions? There's, there's one more herb I want to mention, and that is uh, bay laurel. Do you, you know this plant, okay? Again, if we lived in Southern California, these would be trees as big as a linden tree. I mean, they're incredible. But here, this is a plant that I will put in a bigger pot. I always want a bigger pot because I just, I, I want it to look pretty in my house and they root out very quickly. But the bay is delicious. And when you buy your McCormick can of leaves, they're always the dried that you have to be careful. You use it in your soups and stews, but you have to remove them because they have sharp edges. But I suggest to you that using the fresh new green leaves in your cooking, uh, offer the flavor of olive oil. So that's why I like it. And mine is getting kind of big now, so I decorate it for the holidays. Uh, okay, so I, I'm just seeing if I missed anything uh, or if anybody has any other questions. Yes, I have a question about drying herbs. Um, are there some that are better for drying and are there some that are better preserve, to preserve in other ways? Herbs can be dried. Uh, sometimes I will just put them on layers of paper toweling on my kitchen counter and leave them for three or four days and they will dry. They have to be absolutely perfectly dry before putting them in a closed container. Otherwise you'll get mold. So I dry them between paper towels. Sometimes I will put them on a tray in an unheated gas oven and they will dry overnight. Uh, basil works very, very well that way. Um, and I also freeze some of them too. 
some better than others. Uh, my This Italian parsley I've had for a week and a half, and I have it in my refrigerator in a glass of water that I change periodically, and I have a plastic bag over it. And I'll probably have it another week. So I suggest to you, you can have it for two, two and a half weeks in the refrigerator. Now the basil wouldn't like that. And, but I suggest to you, you keep cutting, recutting the stems and changing the water, but you can have these for a long time. But the, um, the drying thing, um, you know, they'll all dry, they'll all dry. And uh, I just personally prefer, for example, with the uh, rosemary, I prefer, uh, the fresh because the essential oils are so strong in this and the dried rosemary they're so brittle that I don't I don't care for that but uh, all of this they can absolutely dry but I just put them on my counter some people you know they'll bundle them up and they'll hang them upside down you know in a dark room or the garage or somewhere and that that works as well uh, certainly and it's charming or if you were making a tussie mussies to give to somebody, you'd have bundles of these branches and you could give them fresh and they could dry them just as they are. Uh, you can even put a little rosebud in there too that would dry beautifully. Uh, it's just then you have to keep them away from the water. Okay, I have two questions about rosemary. One Thanks. is, uh, if you're bringing it in for the winter, how do you prevent bringing in gnats that may be in the soil? Well, I've not had any problems with gnats with rosemary. It's so strong. That's not their favorite thing. They tend to go after things like the annual hibiscus. They love that. Um, there are different um, uh, soap, what do you call that, Becca? Um, the insecticidal soap? Insecticidal soaps that you can use, but you're right because these things will lay eggs in the soil. So when you get white flies and gnats, um, Would you recommend repotting or removing the soil from the roots and repotting it? You can do that as well. Uh, sometimes to do that, well, all right, so they're out, let's just say they're outside, so who knows what is getting in your pot. So first of all, I've got to have a saucer. Uh, I always have a saucer under my plants so things don't go up through the bottom. Okay, then before I bring them in, I am shaking them like crazy, and I might even uh, hose them down outside or put them in my shower if it's already too cold. Uh, and sometimes before I do that, I'll scrape off the top inch of soil because there could be little eggs and things in there as well. But I don't want any bugs in my house. Okay, they're not invited. So I try to take certain steps. Um, there are other uh, friendly uh, sprays you can use if you put the plant in a bag and, and spray it. But these are all edible things. And so you really, really have to be careful. So I prefer to turn them upside down and shake out the extra soil and, and really hose them down. And I really, I really haven't had any problem with that. But there are other plants that we bring in that are definitely magnets for the uh, plants. But the herbs are, are pretty usually OK. Um. Nalini mentioned neem spray or neem oil, which will work as well and is also certified for organic gardening. Um, neem and we do carry neem oil here. Yes, we do. Well, yes, we do. Uh, and maybe people are comfortable with that. Um, I cook all the time with this stuff. So I'm really just, uh, before I use anything for cooking, uh, I am rinsing it off in my sprayer in my sink and I let them dry. Uh, one of the reasons is to make sure they're clean, but also any of your uh, salad dressings or vinaigrettes will not adhere if the leaves are wet. It's just like lettuce. You have to dry it before you mix it in your salad. Otherwise, the dressings just run off. Um, but yeah, anything that we sell, it'll say right in the directive, you know, uh, best use, how, when. But uh, personally, I'm more of a just rinse it off. Okay, and then um, we, we do carry several varieties of rosemary. Uh, can you just talk briefly about the difference between them? Sure, sure. Uh, some of these are, I mean, they're just, to me, irresistible. And I did bring back a couple of varieties from San Francisco because I couldn't help myself and I wanted us to have them. And it doesn't matter since they're not hardy anyway. So 
we're growing them all. And uh, this one that I showed you, this is the rosemary frustratus. This is the creeping rosemary. And it drapes down, it hangs down. It's incredible in containers or window boxes. It's wonderful. They all have a very similar flavor, uh, which is strong. So we use it carefully. Uh, and again, I know I mentioned the barbecue, which is really straight up. And in our growing season, you're, you're probably looking at a foot and a half. I mean, they'll be incredible. But we have several other varieties uh, as listed in our catalogs. Um, but they'll all be available. Most of them are in a three inch pot. We do have some that also come in a four inch pot and they're, they're not as fast growing as let's say your basil, uh, but they're very, very tough. And um, I can tell you how many we have if you'd like. Uh, let's see. Know what page this is on. We have these incredible new catalogs for our 85th year. And on page 43. Rosemary, we have, rosemary, we have four rosemary. Four varieties. So I'm looking to see what we've got. Here it is. Yeah. So the officinalis is the traditional basic rosemary that we all know and love. And that is what you see anywhere. The rosemary officinalis, that's your basic one. The barbecue we talked about, that's the straight up one. The creeping rosemary I showed you. And Madeline Hill, uh, this is another sizable one with lots of branching, but I would describe it as having slightly smaller needles. Uh, they all have blue flowers, which are edible. Uh, Madeline comes uh, usually just in a three inch pot too. Um, and they're all, uh, I would describe them as vertical and spiky, uh, but uh, they're incredible. Uh, they're incredible. Just have to keep an eye on that watering. Um, oh, I had a question about containers, like the best type of container to use uh, material, material wise. Yeah. Well, it's always nice if you can have something that breathes but as long as it has drainage, that's key. Uh, I will tell you that I really love to put, a, it's the only time ever, ever, ever that I will use a piece of landscape fabric because I don't believe in it, but I will put a piece at the bottom of whatever container. You have to have drainage with these herbs. They want their water, they want their full sun. I don't like to, I like to do at least a 10 inch pot um, so I don't have to water it all the time. I mean, cute little four inch pots, are, six, that's fine, but you're gonna be attending to those a little bit more. Ceramic pots are fine. I have some beautiful ceramic pots at home and I put an insert in it, uh, whether it's plastic or terracotta, whatever it is, but it has to have drainage. And sometimes, for example, let's just say, um, let's just say I put this time into a pretty container um, that doesn't have drainage. Okay, so then I have this in an insert. So this would go in a pretty pot and I take this out. So now it's in the house because it's too cold to put it out. And I'll put this in a cereal bowl with water. And that's how I'll water these from the bottom up. And then it gets set into a pretty container. You can use any container you want. You can use resin or a pretty ceramic or terracotta, you can use anything you want, but you have to have drainage. That's really, really important. And I really like when you can put an insert into the container, then you can have any kind of container that you already have, or we have these gorgeous pots out here, but then you can remove it to bring it inside uh, in the fall. Does anybody have any other questions? Did we forget anything, Joni? Uh, there's just one thing I want you to remember, okay? And I tell this to everybody. If there's nothing else that you remember from this little herb visit we're having, remember this. Herbs are leaves. Spices are seeds, okay? Herbs are leaves. Spices are seeds. For example, cilantro, you know, it's an herb. But when it gets its little seeds, it becomes coriander two different plants, uh, herbs or leaves, spices or seeds. 
we have an incredible selection. I've been all over the state looking at herbs and plants and nobody has herbs. Nobody grows the quality of herbs that we do here at The Growing Place. They're absolutely magnificent and both at our Naperville store and at our Aurora store. And if they're not out on the table yet, it means we think it might be just a little bit cold to put them out. But if you want them, you know, and put them in your house, we'll go again for you. So anyway, they're a wonderful group of plants. So there's nothing easier to grow than herbs. Just remember they like sun and good drainage and use them because herbs, whatever they are, they're useful plants. So thank you for coming. I have one uh, other question I have to, uh, first of all, I've got a couple of requests for a cooking class from you. So we'll have to <laughs> think about that for the future. Um, secondly, I had a question about the potting soil and it's uh, if it's good for all herbs. And our potting mix is just a basic, basic mix. So you, it's good for annuals it's good for any container so annuals yeah. uh herbs vegetables whatever you would just have you would like so if you're growing tomatoes you would add the tomato tone which is the fertilizer yeah. or product that we yeah. recommend to put with it so sure. you just kind of add what you need to it um, and then another question about how to get in touch with you you work what five days a week here I'm in the here. season when it feels like every day but not, not every, every day, day. Yes. So, <laughs> Uh, but Jody's, I'm always, Jody's always at the Aurora store and available for a phone call when we're open yes, for the season. For sure. For sure. Uh, and if you have time to look at this book, does it come up backwards on there? But it's it's uh, the no, Rodell's okay. Illustrated Encyclopedia of uh, Herbs. And this is a tremendous resource that the U of I uses as a um, one of their, their books uh, for some of their horticulture classes. So there's lots and lots of herb books available and, uh, or I can recommend another, but you know, our, uh, our staff here and at Naperville, they're well-versed in our herbs. So we can all help you and we're very happy to. So, so take good care of your little pot. Um, Mary, Mary also asked about worm castings and yes, you can ask, add worm castings to your, that's a good fertilizer for a lot sure. of things. Yes, yep. absolutely. All right. So thank you everybody for coming and we will see you in one week. We got seven days to go. Have a good, uh, enjoy the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.